Hi, everybody. I am so excited to get to welcome you into this space. My name is Carrie Lucking. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm the executive director at Education Minnesota, uh, the state's educator union. Um, and I'm excited to be here because we are incredibly invested uh, in what's going to be shared with you today. Um, you know, I think that since uh, Governor Walls has uh, hopped onto the presidential ticket, we're reminded of Minnesota exceptionalism and the fact that Minnesotans really like to kind of brag on how awesome we are. But I think sometimes we forget actually where our, our exceptionalism comes from. Um, and one of the places where we came together as a community uh, back in 2018 is actually a, a foundation of that greatness. So you may remember 2018 was another pretty dark and scary time. Uh, Donald Trump has been had been elected president just two years before. We had really important electoral races happening across the state. Um, and also campaign messaging that was extraordinarily fear-based. Um, and really uh, appealing to folks, folks as lesser angels, not their greatest angels. And we came together as a community and uh, founded and funded uh, Greater Than Fear, which was a project around how to combat that sort of fear-based messaging with messages that would ignite, inspire, and excite our folks to participate in democracy. Um, and dang, did it work. And I think we forget this part, it worked. Okay, the headline of the Star Tribune after the, the day after the 2018 election was DFL sweeps the state. We won it all. And then in 2020, we, we turned around and we won ourselves as a trifecta and made incredible for progress uh, on the things that we care about. And so we're in another pretty scary time that we don't have to reiterate the stakes of this election uh, to anyone, I don't think. And we're in a time that calls for us once again to come together um, and to figure out how it is that we are going to combat uh, fear and hatred and race baiting in a way that not only is effective in winning the election that is important to moving our priorities, but also that brings us together around our um, shared values and our common vision for what our country could be. And so that's what this project is about. We are um, so excited to have you here today to share this project and to share with you some incredible uh, expertise um, around how to use the work uh, to move an agenda and to bring people together. So. With that, uh, enjoy the next time that you have together. I think if uh, if it's a, at all as inspiring to you as it has been to, to me, um, I think you're gonna leave this space being pretty fired up about the next few months. Oh, I have to do the rules, I'm sorry. We were just joking about the lawyers actually getting mad at us. So one important thing. <laughs> Uh, is that we're all clear uh, about the fact that we are uh, on the right side of the law. So I'm going to very, uh, very much read this to you so I don't get it wrong so that the lawyers also don't get mad at me. Um, this briefing is open to organizations and individuals who are participating in the election in various capacities, including candidates, campaigns, organizations, organizations working on the coordinated side, and organizations conducting independent expenditures. Because of this, all participants need to agree to not share any non-public information with other participants regarding candidate plans, strategies or needs, or regarding any plan independent expenditure activities or communications. So when we get to questions in the sharing part, okay, please do not post your campaign plan in the chat. Just as a for example, um, that's not that's a no. That's a no-go. Um, but please do participate robustly in the conversation that's about to happen. And I'm going to kick it to you, Janae. Thank you so much, Carrie. Yes, yes. All right. All right, everyone. We are, as Carrie mentioned, we're here for really exciting times. We are in an exciting time in Minnesota. We are, many of us have been, you know, walls pilled for a long time, and we are seeing the rest of the country get 
very excited about Governor Walz. As a matter of fact, of the four people at the top of the presidential ticket, he is the most popular. We have seen that time and time again in a lot of the polling that has been happening nationally. And that's great. And a huge reason why he is so popular is because of the work that all of us on this call have done. Not just us as the panelists, but all of you attendees. We have been kicking butt for well over a decade to get the kind of sweeping policies that we were able to pass last year, the ways in which we've been protecting families, we've been advocating for workers, we've been making sure kids have the things they need. All of that stuff has happened and Walls has, uh, has accrued a lot of power nationally because of it. And he's getting a lot of like very valid uh, excitement. And we have to be abundantly and rigorously clear about what that means for us and the work that we have to do this election. What we cannot do is sit on our laurels and think, oh, Minnesota is fine. We'll be safe. We have this in the bag. Because even if, even if the, the you know, there is a, an inkling of you that wants to think that about the presidential, what we are going to do is burst that little bubble for you about the rest of the state. Because what we have found in our, in our research that we've been running for months now, and yes, some of it was prior to, uh, to the big changes that have happened at the presidential ticket, but what we've seen in it is that it actually, the presidential ticket does not, the, the excitement about it or the, you know, malaise about it does not necessarily accrue to what's happening in our House and Senate race. So what we have to do is we have to remember that the state of Minnesota is so exciting right now, has all eyes on us right now, is getting lifted up in beautiful ways and also will be attacked in very specific ways throughout this election. It is all happening because of this next slide. What is at stake for us? It is the sheer fact, the next slide, Yep, there we go. All right, so it is because Minnesota has been establishing ourselves as the best state for children's workers, families. And it's a beautiful thing, again, that Walls gets to go out and he is like shouting to the high heavens how, how amazing and incredible and dope we are. And also most people, and that is including here in the state of Minnesota, don't understand all of the nuances of our civic engagement or civic government and civic understandings of how this works. And so there could be, we have the numbers, the proven numbers to show that there could be that we win the presidential race and we lose the house. That could absolutely happen. As a matter of fact, what we found when it comes to swing voters in Minnesota, we have a lot of great news that we'll talk about in the research, especially regarding Trump and swing voters. But what we also have found with swing voters is that they, if you just talk about the Democratic trifecta and keeping it, they want to break it up. You have to have very specific conversations with people about what we have done, what has been made possible in a very concrete, tangible way. Things like paid family medical leave, things like the child tax credit that's cut child poverty by 30%, things like protecting voting rights. Those kinds of, you have to very concretely name what we have done together in order to get them to a place where they'd be kind of willing to keep a trifecta. It is a wild and wacky world that we're, we are in right now in Minnesota, where we have to keep, stay on our P's and Q's about ensuring that Minnesotans are clear about the future that we get to create together, but also are very clear about the alternative. And so this entire briefing is going to be about contrasting futures. And I'll let my team uh, who are going to go over the actual research get into what we've learned about it and how we're going to use it. But the benefit, especially for this briefing for you all, because um, as a communicator, I've experienced this quite a bit, but I imagine you politicos and directors and campaign folks have also had experiences where you get a whole lot of research and you have no idea what to do with it. It's just cool knowledge that you kind of got to figure out. And the benefit to this is we are going to give you the research top lines. We're going to give you even a little bit of what's underneath the top lines. And then we're also going to give you some tools on what to do about it. So as Carrie mentioned, we were able to leverage a full, broad, big statewide campaign in 2018 called Greater Than Fear. 
this year we're going to do it even bigger and better and it's going to be we make our future and so this is a um a preparation for it as we are launching into that with all the things all the tools all the swag that we will need to carry that message and create an echo chamber for the rest of the country. And the benefit is, is what we have noticed is that on the federal side, they have actually been using a bunch of future forward messaging as well that is also about contrasting futures. So we get to be the, the group of folks that are like shaking the tree from, from all of the branches and the trunk, uh, if you will. Okay, so I am gonna get ready to pass this to my folks, but one other thing that I wanna flag for us because I have talked about these contrast futures and all the beautiful things and how we have to full-throatedly talk about all the things on our end here in Minnesota about what we won, what we got, and what we can go and do, right? That we're not finished, we're just getting started making Minnesota the best state in the country. And we should absolutely be prepared for what's to come and it is going to continue. What we're seeing right now is like a lot of spaghetti being thrown at the wall around how to chip away at the, the massive popularity of Governor Walls, who is now a candidate for vice president. But what we'll also see is that happening on every level of government within the state of Minnesota. And what we are know, what we know is are going to be several attacks are going to be race pace. I'm sorry, that race-based attacks, um, as well as place-based attacks. And so we want everyone to be prepared with all the tools that you need to be on offense, talking in our frame, not falling back on your heels because now you feel like you're in the defense mode. What we know is that when we lean in, when we talk about these things in our values, and we have some like very cool and strategic ways to do it that we'll name it uh, towards the end of the presentation. Okay. Now I'm gonna pass it along to Chris and Trevor who are gonna talk about the strategy, I'm sorry, about the research that's gonna underlie our strategy. All right, thanks Janae, that was a great setup. Um, first of all, I'm gonna ground us in a little bit of the data that we gathered on kind of the horse race stuff. Um, when we were out in the field on this poll uh, from June 27th to July 7th, um, we found that it was a statistical tie uh, across the House races between a generic D and a generic uh, Republican with 17% undecided, just to kind of level set. When we looked in our battleground districts, generic Republicans were list were winning by six points, 45 to 39 over generic Dems. Now, we preface this with, I'm going to say, and we're going to get into it a little later too. This was when Biden was still at the top of the ticket. This is when we had a lot of Dem doubters, people who would lean Dem, but were not committed to voting for the party because of uh, frustration with the top of the ticket. Um, this was before uh, Harris uh, moved up and was nominated. This is before the political assassination, attempted assassination, pardon me. And this was before Walls was named to the top of the ticket. However, we did design this whole project to really sort of suss out the difference between what st was happening in state level politics and national level. So we're still very uh, comfortable with these messaging recommendations when it pertains to sort of these state level races and, and how they're gonna interact, we think, with the top of the ticket. Okay, so I'm gonna kind of go over top our messaging recommendations. We're gonna do this a little bit backwards and give you the recommendations first and a lot of the methodology stuff afterwards. Uh, and then of course we can dive deeper and provide more for folks who wanna get really into that methodological stuff. Okay, so first one, uh, if we could go one, uh, as Janae said, uh, our best place to frame this election is a choice between two futures, not two candidates and two parties. It is between progressive freedoms and sort of mega control of our lives. Um, that freedom frame allows us to talk about a lot of different issues in some very specific ways that are productive. Uh, likewise, the control of our lives lets us really sort of criticize and critique the uh, mega agenda in a lot of different ways, which is why we uh, like this frame quite a bit. Um, freedom no recommendation number two is about loss framing the gains made for Minnesota families as a strong motivator, particularly for DFL voters and persuadables. Now, I'm going to say this. When we talk about these gains, we are talking about the individual policies that were passed, uh, particularly on that front list, and maybe a couple other ones I'm going to suggest later on in my presentation. Um, what is not particularly motivating is talking about in the context of protecting the trifecta, 
protecting DFL control, anything that is process-based and partisan-based. But when you talk about making sure no one rolls back paid family leave, that's good. No one rolls back free lunches and free food for kids in schools. That's productive. Um, so we want to say the good things, but we always want to insinuate these are not permanent. They could go away if we do not choose the right path in this election. Uh, there's a quote that kind of comes to mind that says the way to love anything is to realize, realize that it might be lost. So we want to loss frame all of these things, not just list them. Uh, number three, please. Link them and sink them. Uh, we have we tested a little unusually the notion that how would a Trump endorsement, either of a candidate in, at the state level or a state level endorsing Trump, affect their perceptions? And what we found was there's literally no downside to doing this. Um, our persuadables, we're going to find that it's, we, we kind of gave an option of, uh, does it make you more likely to be a voter, less likely to be a voter, no difference. And the plurality said it's more likely to vote against Trump, or more likely to vote against that candidate. So there's clearly an advantage here to linking our candidates to Trump and to Project 2025. And I threw in 2025. We specifically didn't poll on that. Uh, in this, but there's been a lot of other research done in the battleground states uh, in the last few weeks that suggests that to anyone who knows what Project 2025 is, it is a strongly negative thing. Okay, number four. We want to cast wealthy corporations as the villain in our story and our narratives, but we need to add progressive cues because, as it turns out, just about everyone across the political spectrum now resents corporate power over their lives. And we want to do these progressive cues and we'll talk a little bit about how to do that in a slide or two from here. Um, because when we just say, you know, corporations are the villain or corporations have too much control, we are activating a thought, we believe, in some of the Republican types that when they say wealthy corporations, they're talking about uh, wokeness in the Disney movies or a rainbow colored T-shirt at being sold at Target. And that's clearly not what we're talking about. So we need to sort of talk about corporations having too much power, but then add to that some cues about why we why we dislike that and kind of what we want to see happen next. We go to number five. All right, ABCs, always be contrasting. Whenever we're talking about anything on this top four list, we need to sort of set it up as a choice and between what we want to do and what can be taken away, between two different paths, two different futures, etc. cetera. Um, straight up listing is not nearly as effective as putting things in that sort of contrasting context. All right now we're going to do a couple of slides. I'm just going to dive down into these points a little bit, and I'm going to pass it over to Trevor uh, to talk about methodology. So Trevor, can we go to the next one? All right. So this is a sample message that we tested about freedom and control, and you're going to see a very familiar structure that we use in the race class gender narrative, where we start off with a lead value and we end with a vision, and we're very uh, intentional about being inclusive. So in this one, very similar one that we're going to see, you've probably seen in messages written by folks on this call. You know, we know Minnesotans know we're stronger when we work together and there are uh, there for one each other through good times and bad. But today, MAGA Republicans try to control us by imposing their agenda that threatens our freedoms. Again, the contrast. We talk about uh, choice. Then we want to control with and when we can start a family to ban books in our schools and keep us from coming together to demand government that protects our freedoms. And then we make, the, in this case, we end with a voter message. Uh, our vote is our power and we join together as voters. We can elect leaders to ensure every Minnesotan has the freedom to thrive, no exception. Now, I'm not gonna say this is the only way to do a freedom and control message because there's gonna be others. Uh, we can substitute some of those elements in the middle out for specific policies, for specific races and situations. But this gives you a sense of the structure and sort of that frame we're talking about. Okay, Trevor, can we go to the next one? As we said, for House members who are incumbents in particular, there is advantages to running on the record. But when we talk about that record, we need to be very careful about tying every policy to what it means to for families in real life. Not sort of a political thing, not a policy thing. Your family is better off with us because we did this. Okay? There is, it is not the best play to talk about protecting a party majority or to talk about legislative process. Okay, when we did a little bit of uh, teasing this out about what are the most popular legislative accomplishments, we're going to see things around voting rights, free school meals, education funding, we're not the top. 
Um, as I mentioned, there was a couple policies that I think are probably not getting talked about enough that certainly have a lot of potential. Uh, one of which is the ban on book bans law that was passed. Um, what we found was our persuadable voters and our swing voters had very strong concerns about Republican plans to ban books. And I think there's an opportunity there to educate and agitate around the book bans law, especially again with loss framing of we passed this law, great, right, but it could go away if other folks are in charge. Okay, next. Okay, a little bit deeper dive into that, uh, talking about the record and progress and loss. Okay, again, you're gonna see one of our sort of standard kind of RCN leads on this. No matter what we look like or where we come from, most Minnesotans work hard for our families. We want our leaders to work hard for us too. And there's, we're kind of amplifying that get things done here. But while Democrats work together to pass laws that solve real problems, curb corporate overreach and help people across Minnesota, MAG Republicans are focusing on dividing us and taking away our freedoms. And then we kind of cast our policy issues in that freedom frame. Solving problems, making health care, child care and lives more affordable, strengthen our public institutions and public schools, pardon me, instead of focusing on banning books, regulating bathrooms and banning abortion. And then you could easily take a message like this and turn it into a GOTV or even a persuasion message at the same time. All right. Can we go down one next one? As I mentioned, as it turns out, uh, Donald Trump is not likable to the sort of folks that we consider our base and swings in Minnesota. Uh, there's very little chance of backlash of doing this. And I know as a communications professional, what people really want to slide is lots of tiny letters and tiny numbers. So we're just going to leave this here for a moment. But the main takeaway is linking a, a local candidate, a statewide candidate, or pardon me, a state house candidate, to Trump is all to the good. All right. And in fact, uh, just to dive down a little bit, you know, what we're seeing is 30%, 39% of voters said they would be less likely to vote for a candidate to endorse Trump, 22% would be more likely, and 35% said it makes no difference. So if you have the space, if you have the time, it's a pretty good thing to mention, and a nice contrast what's happening. And I know, as uh, Kerry Lucking has pointed out, it's a little counterintuitive because usually the straight shot in politics is better than the bank shot. That seems to not be in force here, and I suspect it has something to do with Trump has now become just a mental shortcut to all the bad things in MAGA that people don't like, rather than just a standalone candidate. Okay, can we go to the next one? All right, as I mentioned, no one across the political spectrum right now likes large corporations or greedy corporations, and that's a small problem. And what you're seeing here is a, a series of statements that we presented to voters to see if they, they would make them more or less motivated to be a voter. And so what you're seeing is show up, uh, these are, by the way, these are sort of shortened versions. They're not the actual sentences we tested, but show wealthy corporations we choose our leaders, not them. And what you're seeing is Dems react strongly to it, independents react strongly to it, but Republicans do too. So that's why we're sort of saying we really need to make sure that when we use that, uh, we cast the, the, the corporations as villains, we need to make sure that we're also saying a few other things. Um, one of the things we might want to do, for instance, if you're talking this year, uh, if you're going to cast them as villains, you might want to say some of the things that... Uh, Democrats have done. And one of those might be uh, making international corporations pay their fair, coming closer to making international corporations pay their fair share in taxes, uh, which is through the guilty law that was passed. Um, again, you're going to see some of the other powerful motivators here. We tested a few sort of Republican talking points about rain and spending, stop work indoctrination, as you can tell, don't really work for Dems, somewhat effective for uh, dependents, but very responsible for Republicans. And I also mentioned that when we talk about that contrast between uh, promoting freedom, choosing freedom or defending democracy, they both tend to perform about the same, but our recommendation is to use that freedom frame because again, it's just, it has more utility than the democracy frame. Uh, you can easily talk about uh, reproductive rights in there. You can talk about the freedom to learn. You can talk about freedom to raise your family. You can talk about freedom to live a healthy life. It's just easier to work with for a lot of settings than the democracy. And again, protecting gains did okay. Protecting the democratic majority, yeah, not so well. There's better choices. Okay, so let's go down one more. 
All right. So now we're talking about our messaging summary. And again, I told them that uh, I would keep it kind of short. We always want to lead with our values. Our best values right now are the values our family and freedom. Okay. And when we center freedom, as I just mentioned, we might want to talk about uh, democracy and voting rights, the freedom to vote, education, the freedom to learn, uh, choice, uh, if and when, uh, the freedom to decide when and if to grow our families. And we can always want to talk about this in the contrast, as we mentioned, to emphasize the freedoms of MAG Republicans to contrast uh, their desire to control, to control what we read, to control who gets to live as their authentic selves in, uh, in society, uh, which kids in our schools deserve to get the, the full amount of respect every kid deserves, that kind of contrast. Um, you'll hear me use, and probably some other folks in this call use the modifier MAGA when referencing Republicans. Uh, that is a very intentional choice, and we use that over extremism uh, in almost every context. And the reason we do that is that by creating a differentiation between MAGA and MAGA Republicans, we allow all of those never Trumpers and all of those folks uh, up to, including my father, it turns out, um, who like to think of themselves as Republicans, but have been turned off and repelled by what's been happening really since 2015 or so with the rise of Donald Trump and the MAGA movement. It allows us to kind of build a bigger tent. Um, we also don't particularly like extremism, uh, and I'll just kind of riff on that for one second. When you talk about extremism, extremism is sort of in the eye of the beholder. Um, it is sort of referencing the far ends of the poles of political thought, and it doesn't really fit because right now what often people call extremism is in fact sort of the mainstream MAGA movement that has taken over the Republican Party. It's not at the end, it's in the middle. Um, also, as a label, it can kind of be applied to liberals and to, to progressives, um, which means it has some of it, it loses some of its power. MAGA is much more definite and refers to the movement we're talking about. Okay, as you mentioned, the Trump endorsements, whether Trump endorses a local House candidate, House candidates endorse Trump, um, it's a non-starter for our persuadable and swing voters, and it activates our base. It's good for us. And connecting uh, corporations to villains and outcomes, uh, this is a very powerful frame, as I mentioned, across the political spectrum. We want to add some partisan cues. Um, our national pollster really sort of honed in on some things that are in the national agenda for 2025, but I would suggest that local Democrats have some pretty good options there, too. Uh, one of them that comes to mind is how in 2024 we passed the Democratic majority passed a law that would make it uh, almost impossible for health insurance companies to deny care to cancer patients and babies in neonatal wards through abusing that uh, prior authorization idea. Um, that is a, the, what the data is telling us is that that would probably land very well across um, uh, elections, across the electorate. All right, can we go to part two? Again, always be contrasting. Uh, everything that we are talking about is better when it's laid out in contrast to the MAGA agenda and Project 2025. Always, always, always. Uh, a couple examples here at the bottom. When we talk about health, our families, our families to, you know, the freedom for our families to thrive. When we contrast that between what Democrats have done and will do, what Republicans want to do, there's a little loss for anyone in there. Uh, education, we talk about the freedom to learn. We talk about banning books in school libraries versus what Democrats have done. And I think we've seen walls hit this contrast really effectively 50 times in the last three weeks. We want to, you know, we want to feed kids. They want to ban books. It's probably that simple. Uh, also plays extremely well in Minnesota. Uh, and some of you may have heard my presentation on our freedom to learn on education issues. Uh, when we did some national polling or bought into a national poll in February 22 at Education Minnesota, um, and we asked questions about what is a major concern for you, uh, I think we had 57% of Minnesotans says uh, banning books was a major concern. Um, that was the highest number in the United States. There is something about Minnesotans that says that we cannot stand the idea that people are going to deny us the choice to read what we want to read. And again, to kind of wrap it up, our democracy, you know, we should have the freedom to choose our leaders. Our leaders should not have the freedom to choose their voters. Um, Republicans want to uh, make it harder for people to vote, expand and protect the right to vote. Oh, I think someone talked about freedom from gun violence. Yes, Lucy, that fits right into the freedom frame and would work in a lot of different contexts. Now, it also works very well in the school context as well, if that's what you're thinking. 
Okay. And Trevor, I think this is where I hand it to you for the very nerdiest bits. And then uh, I'll be yeah, available thanks. for questions at the end. <laughs> thanks, Chris. Um, like Janae mentioned, uh, the we didn't want to bury the lead in the research aspects and wanted to, to start off with um, like how to actually use it, how to learn from what we take what we learned from our research and actually like apply it onto the real world research that just exists in slide decks, like isn't actually doing the good that we wanted to. So we wanted to start off with the recommendations. I'm going to take a couple minutes to, uh, like lift up the hood a little bit and talk about, uh, the research itself and some of the methodology behind it. Uh, so we did sort of two waves of research. We did a, a statewide survey of voters of, um, 500 registered voters in Minnesota, and then had three over sample groups of 100 people, 100 in our battleground house districts, 100 down on dim likely voters, and then 100 disaffected swing likely voters. I'll talk in a minute just so folks know like how we defined those groups, um, particularly the down on dims and the disaffected. But that was a statewide survey. And then we also uh, did a set of five focus groups in uh, battleground, suburban, and greater uh, Minnesota districts. And I'll show a breakdown for, for each of those so folks have it as well. Um, the, the survey went out kind of coincidentally around the, the same night of the Trump-Biden debate. Um, so whenever he was still at the top of the ticket and 7% of left-leaning voters were expressing doubts about voting for him. Uh, so let's talk about that for a little bit. Because there has been uh, a noticeable vibe shift. Uh, Harris is obviously at the top of the ticket. And if, even more recently, uh, Walls has has joined that ticket as well. And obviously, we should expect there to be some impact on uh, the turnout patterns uh, for how the, the change between whenever we did this research to now. And yet, the communications, from a communications perspective, like how we frame this election, the story we're telling about it, um, and how voters internalize it, uh, much of that is like largely the same. Uh, consistently, we found uh, previous to this research and also reinforced by it is that um, people are motivated to be voters whenever we situate them, um, that is like voters, at, at the center of the story of uh, what elections mean and why they matter and not particular candidates. Um, it's effective in short-term work uh, that we're focused on here uh, uh, this fall, but it also builds sort of a long-term resilience that uh, people see themselves as agents for change and that's not being sort of uh, put onto a particular candidate whether they win or lose. And so um, it's also true that with the national dynamics at play that like our research had a particular focus on the Minnesota house and lifting up the story of what we've done here in Minnesota and having voters vote down ballot. And frankly, like walls on the ticket is already happening now. And there's there more so than when we've done this research, there's a clear connective tissue between what's happening on the national landscape with what happened in Minnesota. Um, in, in 2023. And uh, we should not be shy about making those connections. So to talk a little bit about those two groups, so we oversampled um, down on Dems and disaffected swing. For down on Dems, they make up about 7% of the electorate and disaffected swing make up about 3% of the electorate. Down on Dems are not definitely voting for Biden and they're not definitely voting for Trump. And uh, they have unfavorable or no opinion towards Biden, but uh, unlike the disaffected that swing, they agree that it matters who wins the, the election for president. Um, and they say that Trump being reelected would have a very negative effect. Conversely, for disaffected swing, they're uh, also not definitely voting for Biden and definitely not voting for Trump, but they don't agree that it matters who wins the election. They're a little bit more cynical about the impact that it's going to have in their lives. Down on Dems seem to be more concentrated in the Twin Cities, more likely to be women, um, include slightly more Black voters than overall than the overall elected electorate. They are more democratic and uh, slightly younger. 
Uh, disaffected swing, they are slightly more prominent in suburban areas. Um, and the genders makeup is similar to the overall electorate as well as race. They tend to skew more independent and slightly older than the general elected. So just to take like a little bit of a deeper dive in, in understanding these groups, um, for the battleground key groups, what we found to be key motivators is what was talked about around we choose our leaders, not wealthy corporations, as well as to some extent reigning in spending. Um, that was present in uh, one particular focus group that, that we had. And uh, a key motivator for Down on Dems is also that cynicism or critique towards corporations and then folding in um, defending freedoms toward, uh, sorry, not toward, but from MAGA. Disaffected swing, they are uh, quite interested in reigning in spending as well. That was a key motivator. And uh, defending democracy from, from MAGA as well. So this is kind of a, a case in point or just like another reiteration of the Lincoln and Sinkum where um, defending, while disaffected swing are definitely not voting for Trump or Biden, they they do not agree that who wins a presidential matters and in a strange kind of dissonance also are motivated by defending democracy from, from MAGA. Um, in terms of like, top concerns as it relates to MAGA Republicans for the battleground group are particularly interested or concerned about raising raising prescription drug prices and health insurance premium and banning age appropriate books. Down on Dems, their top concerns are also um, uh, raising prescription drug prices and uh, tying Minnesota Republicans to Trump is, is particularly effective with this group. And uh, disaffected swing, raising prescription drug prices as well. So obviously we're getting like a theme or a pattern here. Um, healthcare is, is a top priority for all these groups. And uh, they're also concerned about making it harder for people to vote. A quick breakdown of the focus groups. So they're just listed here. Um, the first one was in the suburbs. Uh, they were uh, ideological base, down on Dems, mix on race and gender. The second focus group was in greater Minnesota, Based down on Dems, also mixed on race and gender. The, sur the third group was in the suburbs. They were dis disaffected swing group, mixed race and gender. And just to do a quick callback to Janae's comment about uh, there being people in this research that wanted to see the trifecta be split up, it was from this group in particular that that came from. There was a concern about um, a consolidation of power um, just for the consolidation of power's sake. And they were a little bit suspicious of that and um, believe that nonpartisanship or rather like bipartisanship, even if nothing gets done, is, is it a value that they hold in kind of a strained dissonance of also wanting things to get done. So um, just as an aside, this, this particular focus group line three was particularly interesting. And then uh, four, we had a group in the Twin Cities based down on DIMS mixed gender under 30, and then another group in the Twin Cities who are surge voters, mixed gender, and BIPOC. And uh, now I'm gonna kick it back to Chris to talk about some future issues that we anticipate coming up that we need to kind of get information around and resources for those. Yep. Thanks Trevor. Yeah, and uh, just to amplify something you said, there's always been this sort of powerful line that goes through Minnesota public opinion of, um, I want bipartisanship, but I want that to yield the things that I agree with. I think everyone just kind of wants the world to agree with them. And sometimes that just manifests itself through those questions. But anyway, um, future issues and resources. Uh, we have all looked into our crystal ball a little bit with all the disclaimers that go with that to try to estimate what are some of the issues that are going to be coming at us in the next uh, few weeks of this election. Um, all right, the Trump war room, as you can tell, is pretty much saying where they're going to be going with this. This is one of the Trump's accounts. We think that we're going to be hearing a lot of racially dog whistles uh, around crime, particularly in the Minnesota context of the George Floyd protests. We think that we'll continue to see the culture wars in education, which we've countered pretty effectively in Minnesota with the Freedom to Learn campaign. Waste, fraud, and abuse in government is most likely to rear its head uh, with Defeat Our Future issues. 
uh, Islamophobia. Uh, Janae's going to talk a little bit about that specifically uh, in just a minute. Immigration, which seems to be the main theme of the Trump campaign right now. Uh, immigration, by the way, and I'm talking about this in the most highly racialized, um, anti-Muslim kind of way possible. Uh, misogyny, I think we're having uh, Kamala Harris at the top of the ticket. We're going to see a resurgence of this. Uh, there also seem to be some indications, we're kind of hearing from the national level, that the national kind of MAGA thinkers have sort of written off uh, a lot of uh, women uh, due to their abortion stance, and they are now trying to make inroads using misogyny into some other communities that normally don't vote Republican. Uh, and we'll be providing this group, uh, we'll be providing some information, just general guidance on how to con uh, contradict and respond to disinformation as it appears on social media and other contexts. And I think I'm going to now pass it to... I'm sorry, Trevor, can you remind me who I'm passing it to? Josh. Josh, You're thank up. you. And my friend Josh over at SEIU. Thanks, Chris. Uh, so uh, Josh Keller, uh, he, him, I do communications for SEIU here in Minnesota. Uh, nice to be here with you all. So uh, I, I go to a lot of these briefings, uh, as I'm sure some of you do too. Maybe it's your first briefing. Welcome. But Oftentimes you get all this information, it's it's dense, it's pretty uh, kind of overwhelming, and you think like, okay, well, you know, while I sat through this briefing, my to-do list just grew, and how am I going to possibly use this in my day-to-day -day life in, you know, whatever issue or, or campaign you're working on? So we really want to spend a few minutes talking through the deliverables that we will be sharing with you all, um, and, and talking through a little bit about both things you can take from this that you can put under your own brand or your, your own campaigns, but also uh, how we're going to uh, bring this campaign, which we're calling We Make Our Future, to life and ways that you can just use that as, as tools or um, things to share without even having to kind of recreate anything. Uh, next slide, Trevor. So uh, one more click. There's a... Yep, there's Muppets. Uh, everybody who knows me knows I'm uh, not usually a, a big GIF person, but late last night I was feeling a little punchy, so a few GIFs this round. Um, but all of this stuff is only useful if we say it as people who are leaders. You know, I always tell the star folks, if you're at a meeting, uh, you know, you're one of 88 people here, however many people, uh, you're not normal. You're you're an activist, you are somebody who cares more than the average person. So we need to take this material and get it out to the next layer of folks, our neighbors, our coworkers, our friends, our people in our faith community. Um, and we need to use these tools to help move people in the directions we want to move them. So uh, we, I, I want to show you a few things. Trevor, go to the next one. Uh, that hopefully will help uh, hit a few buttons forward, please. All right. So Thank you. Uh, yeah, one more, and then and then I'll take screen sharing over in a second here. Um, so we are there are created now. They're still kind of in their infancy. Social media accounts uh, under the We Make Our Future banner. So there will be Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Uh, if you're on those platforms, um, you can watch there. We're going to be not only putting some of this content out that you can just automatically share. But that will be where, uh, you know, we'll kind of showcase and model what we found from this research that we think would help get us towards our goal, which is making sure uh, we end threads. Thank you, Trevor. Uh, and maybe more, but for sure, those those accounts will be places you can look now. Um, follow them, share the stuff, uh, tag us in your in your work if you are modeling some of this messaging or, or uh, resources, and we will amplify stuff. Again, as Carrie said, uh, referencing back to the start, the Greater Than Fear campaign was really powerful, not because it had the right ideas. Right ideas are, you know, only one side of the coin. Actually getting people to talk about them and getting that message out there is the only way this stuff is successful. So um, two-way street, you know, we'll try to share stuff you're doing. Uh, if you want to share stuff that we make our future is doing, um, that would be great. Uh there will be a toolkit that is sent out to folks. Uh, Trevor, however, whatever you need to do to make it so I can share my screen so I can walk through this. Thank you. Look at that. 
It worked. Uh, so this will be getting shared with folks uh, imminently I, today, uh, but maybe tomorrow, but this week for sure. And I'm just going to scroll through. I'm not going to go blow by blow because you'll have it uh, in hand shortly. Um, but it's it's a little bit of the like cliff note versions of what you've heard today. And hopefully it's not just cliff notes, but like directional towards being able to use this stuff. So there's a little background uh, again, and this is this is all going to be public, so you can share it with whoever. It's it's kind of safe to share across the different spaces. A little background, uh, some of the key findings. Again, some of you might have been taking notes or screenshotting. You'll get all of this stuff, including this summary document. Uh, it's the the last thirty minutes of Chris and Trevor that they really did a great job of of overviewing. For those of us who maybe learn slightly better by reading things um, and and doing visual learning, so. Blah, 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 stuff that should look familiar, some sample messages. And so there's actually things here that if you have a newsletter that you're writing or a social media post, there's going to be things you can just pull directly from here and use uh, immediately. And then graphics. We know that, especially on social media, having a really kind of powerful, uh, evocative images is really important. So you'll see some stuff here that uh, has the messaging in the kind of brand of We Make the Future, but it's meant to be you know, open source, you can use it. It's not, you know, proprietary that you can't use it. If you want to take these and, and post them on your social media accounts or print them out and have them up in your office, that's great. Um, and there will be more. This will be something that is going to continue grow and continue to be shared. So that, Trevor, you want to pull back up the slide? Uh, thank you. And, and in the chat, Meg put uh, the handles, which is actually helpful. Um, yeah, back a slide, Trevor. And then can we do a quick poll? My tech friends, we want to just get a sense here. This isn't a binding thing by any means, but um, we're hoping to see if folks are interested in having some We Make Our Future swag. And if yes, uh, what would be interest? What you'd be interested in? This isn't a sign up form. This isn't a commitment. We just want to get a sense if people would um, use We Make Our Future swag in the coming months. And if so, what would be the kind of actual thing? So we'll take 30 seconds if folks can do this. If this isn't applicable to you, just exit out and we'll get back to the, the presentation in a sec. But yeah, take 30 seconds and fill this out. Yeah, I see some folks saying, looking forward to the graphics. We have some incredibly talented people on our team, uh, Trevor and Ashley Fairbanks as part of this tour. She's not here today, but um, we're very lucky to have super talented people who can make this really beautiful stuff that helps get our message out there. Um, okay, uh, I think that was enough time, hopefully. And again, uh, on the next slide, there'll be actually a chance to get formally linked in with us. So if you miss the survey, no worries. Um, Trevor, can we go forward a slide, please? Uh, all right. So the update list, I'm going to put, I'm going to do one more thing here. Sorry, my part is uh, a little interactive, but uh, really trying to kind of make this, um, trying to make this a place where you can plug in. Uh, I'm going to put in the chat the, the link. No, I'm not remembering what the exact bitly was. Sorry. Um, we make our future updates. So I'm going to put a link in the chat and it will take you to a Google page. You do not have to do this now, although if you want to, that's fine. But um, in the chat, update. Uh, if you take copy and paste that into a browser, it should take you to a Google form. In that Google form, we are asking for folks to opt in to updates from this uh, set of work. And so 
what that would mean is if we get some new findings, if there's new polling, if we have a new set of graphics or materials, uh, if there's swag that, um, if you copy and paste or if someone else could, uh, are people not seeing? Oh, I sent it to host and panelists. Sorry. Look at that, me being exclusive. That's not fun. Um, and thank you, Aaron. Uh, so if you sign up for that, that will get you on the kind of inner circle uh, sign up list for future materials, for updates, for uh, if we get some buttons or signs or shirts um, uh, and share that around. Again, all are welcome. This uh, this is open to everybody. It will be public facing work that is safely used um, across different spaces. And we will, uh, you know, be somewhat regularly keeping folks up to date, both on social media and through this listserv. And then the last thing is, Chris mentioned the list of places we think our opposition is going. And, you know, they, they're, they're pretty redundant. Uh, they've, they've got their, their hit songs that they like playing that lean into misogyny and Islamophobia and racism. Um, uh, Sorry, everybody. It seems like we might be having a issue with the thing. We'll get it out to you. Um, so we know that stuff is going to come up. And so it's not just new material that is kind of baseline, but it's also going to be responding in a kind of forward looking way uh, to some of the issues that our opposition is going to be bringing. And so in the spirit of knowing that some of this rapid response stuff is coming, we actually have, uh, unfortunately, uh, kind of for the world, but fortunately for as an example of how we're going to use this messaging toolkit uh, narrative, um, Janae is going to share a little bit about a campaign that Faith in Minnesota is rolling out or going to be rolling out um, and, and a chance for you all to kind of plug into some of this work. Janae? All right. All right, everyone. So um, we are, as we named, we're going to send you a toolkit that has a whole, as you saw, a whole slew of lovely things in which you can engage. And if you all, you all know, we use race, class, gender narrative here in Minnesota, um, our labor partners, and um, even like our C3 friends, all of us have been using it and singing from the same songbook. And it has been extremely useful, especially when we are confronted with the race and place-based dog whistles. And so um, we got some great help from Anat Shankar Osario, who is a lead researcher um, and linguist uh, who have worked with race class narrative and helped develop it. Um, and we've been working on some implementation on what how to handle what's to come and so we are launching a full campaign statewide that is not just about any individual thing because we know the like mudslinging and the um like the swamp attacks that we're we're seeing now are just going to continue to grow so you know the the military valor attacks the attacks on uh, what happened with George Floyd and the uprising the res the covid response attacks um islamophobia and what we imagine also to be some attacks around feeding our future like there's going to be a whole set of things that we as Minnesotans just need to be grounded, ready, prepared, and full-throatedly ready to go on offense about. And so while we have named many times over, and it's important to know for repetition that we need to be contrasting our futures, the other thing that is really helpful in this fight is being able to put people in a spirit of defiance. Um, so instead of like being on defense, we get to go on offense. And so we are launching a, a campaign that is connected to the We Make Our Future campaign that is going to be called, uh, Hey, Fellow 49. And that 49 is the 49 states, um, uh, not including Minnesota, but it is going to be Minnesotans talking to the 49 states out there about what's happening and why they're seeing it, right? Right. So we can, what we'll be doing is essentially be, like using our, our extraordinary Minnesota niceness as a good superpower um, to talk about how, you know what, you all out there might be seeing a lot of like hate and race-based attacks on Minnesotans, on our governor, on what's happening in our state. 
And it's gonna, and it's something that we've experienced before. We have experienced dog whistles that come against our Somali neighbors. We've experienced dog whistles that try to pit us against our folks in rural Minnesota versus folks who are in the Twin Cities. We have experienced all these levels of attack over and over and over again. And you know why we're experiencing them? Because we have paid family medical leave. Because we got the best child tax credit in the country, because we've actually taken real climate action. We choose to reject those over and over and over again. We reject those attacks, we reject those divisions, and we get to win things. We need and want the rest of the country to have them too. And the folks who are attacking us and trying to distract us with all these little silly and stupid things, they're doing it because they want you to not have paid family medical leave. They want you to not have the things that actually allow your family to thrive. But you can get them too. Reject this dumb stuff. Come on, fellow 49, we can do this. And it is like that like defiance message that like full-throated, like telling them the reason that you're seeing this, the reason that you're hearing this, the reason that you're trying to be distracted from what we can have is because they want to pull it. Like they know they have nothing good to offer you. So they're just going to make you afraid of each other. And so we have some toolkits that'll help you be able to do that full-throatedly, ways in which you can get your own people, your campaigns, your, uh, your members, um, your leaders using this on social, loud and proud. And it is a way in which we can inoculate people both for the now um, and to get them ready for what we know is going to build and to come. And so it gets us ready. It also gets to tell a big story nationally. Um, if you all remember, in 2020, we did a very similar thing um, called I'm a Suburban Mom. Uh, and that started because at the time, um, right during the, the racial uprising that was happening, um, Paul Gazelka decided to make a statement and say that uh, Governor Walls should apologize to all the moms in the suburbs for what's happening in Minneapolis. And we knew right away that was a racial dog whistle. It's a dog whistle trying to say that suburban moms are like white lady soccer moms only, and that people in Minneapolis are those scary Black people that you should be afraid of. And so there was a full on campaign launch called I'm a Suburban Mom. And it was moms across the suburbs, across race, really talking about, hey, I'm a suburban mom. And actually, I am very, very, very upset. And it's not because of the reactions that we're seeing in Minneapolis. It's because of the fact that we have had a police department that keeps harming Black people. Like, hey, I'm a suburban mom. And I think what you just tried to do there was call out just white ladies and like all of us, all our, all these moms are uniting and saying we really need to do something about police brutality. And so it got so big on Twitter that it actually made it to the New York Times. We did a big video after a lot of big organic pushes. We can do that again and we can continue to have really great and amazing momentum as people really lean in, they become defiant, they become clear eyed about what's to come and we have the tools that we need to do it together. All right, so we have talked quite a bit about lots of tools, lots of resources. We're getting you all that stuff um, and we wanna take some questions. So uh, just as another reminder, as we're going into our Q&A section, we actually do have a Q&A section on this webinar that you can type your questions in directly, which may be easier to manage than doing it through the chat. Um, but we want to take your questions. And remember, if you are in a campaign, um, if you're doing any kind of coordinated work and you know coordinated plans, if you're doing IE work and you know IE plans, all of us are in one big happy family today, which means you got to keep that. Uh, oh, okay. It looks like host turned off the Q&A. So we are going to let, oh, okay. Maybe it's working now. Is it working now, folks, the Q&A section? Excellent. It looks like it is working. All right. So leverage that Q&A section. We are going to take questions and you can ask questions about anything from implementation, as long as it is not like very specific to the targeting timelines or, or talking points of your own very specific campaign. Um, we can also answer questions about the research itself. Um, about some analysis that we've gotten from this research, anything that we've just talked about today, um, things that you're hoping we we do for the future, we want to hear from you. 
So please, please, please populate that Q&A section and we're going to take some of those questions. And then I'm going to give folks like 30 seconds to also make sure you're filling out. Wait, did we get the, the form corrected so that people can fill out and make sure that they're signed up and they're getting their staff members, leaders, forwarding them that link to sign up so that you can get all of the graphics as we're creating them. We will be making an ad um, that will be open source. Everything that we're going to create is all open source, free to use for you all. So um, creating the, the graphics, the video, et cetera. Um, and we'll be making sure we get that content to you. And then also, as we know, rapid response opportunities happen, big things happen, some big thing happens in the news. We will most certainly be getting you all like messaging guides, um, tools and things that are helpful. We will also be doing some updated message testing in September um, because as you know, the political arena continues to shift. And so we're gonna continue to do testing um, because unfortunately, because so much is happening right now, a lot of the very current and very recent um, polling isn't always very reliable for the long term. It's just a snapshot for the moment. So we want to get some more reliable information for the long term. All right. So we have a few questions there along the lines of um, how to tie a uh, candidates to Trump, especially if they've been relatively quiet or there's not an endorsement. Um, so uh, would uh, Trevor and Chris, would you want to try to take? Sure, I can I can go. Um, the answer is I, I there probably isn't a single best way, but it's going to be standard campaign stuff. It's going to be reviewing state public statements. It's going to be reviewing social media accounts. Um, it's going to be sending in people to listen to campaign uh, events, uh, League of Women Voters debates, those sorts of things. Um, probably organically, some questions about the top of the ticket are going to come up, uh, and maybe not organically. Maybe if there's a candidate who has an opportunity to submit questions for a debate, that's one you could ask. Um, if it's not already abundantly clear, it's probably something that can at least be uh, sussed out through the normal sorts of things that happen during a campaign. Great. And then, Chris, I guess I think it would be fair to you, you mentioned a couple of times just the use of MAGA Republicans as a qualifier even is, is sort of helpful in our messaging. Sure. Um, just to kind of amplify that a little bit, I know I was probably uh, giving out a lot of words. Um, we use the MAGA modifier uh, because it sort of gives a permission structure for people who might consider themselves Republican or nonpartisan to uh, identify a group of folks that aren't just everybody who is a Republican or ever might call them. You're, you're designating and, and sort of specifying a particular movement and particular set of beliefs shared by that candidate and, and the rest of that movement. And that's, again, that's why we don't, we'll, we will very rarely uh, say Republicans or Democrats. Mm -hmm. uh, we will most likely say MAGA Republicans when we're building our contrasts. Yep. And, and to that point, Chris um, and others, the big thing that, of course, we're remembering is that this is about contrasting futures. So even if this particular candidate hasn't explicitly endorsed Trump, they could, um, if, they're, if their platform is like fully aligned with a Trumpy platform, right? If the things that they're advocating for are the same things that are in um you know, project 2025, being able to say like, they have a, they, they, you know, even if they denounce Trump, frankly, you could say, yeah, this is what you're saying, but your, your plans, the things you're promoting, what you're advocating for all actually are really fully aligned with him. Um, so just like being very clear about here's the future that they're planning for. And it looks real Trumpy to me. What do you think? And also remembering, and here's the future that I am casting. Uh, 
There was a question about whether the fellow 49 um, messaging is already included in the toolkit or whether that's something that's more forthcoming. We do have we do have fellow 49 toolkit. So yes, it'll and we can actually put the there right now they're two separate things, but we could probably just put the link right in there. So you all will have uh, the content for fellow 49 as well. All right, and then uh, just in general, it just sounds like you're there's curiosity about if it's already being used. This the the framework of like race class narrative, race class gender narrative has been being used since 2018, um, especially full throatedly here in Minnesota. Uh, and then we have used a series of uh, um, like manifestations of it. Um, through Greater Than Fear, uh, through We Make Minnesota. There's been a lot of ways in which we've been leaning in. So this We Make Our Future is the the new iteration, if you will, um, that is that is being launched. So it will be embedded in, I'm sure, a lot of scripts, a lot of door knocks, a lot of um, a lot of canvassing and a lot of social and um, both organic and earned media. The other thing to note that I think is really important for us to know and notice is to see the kinds of ways in which we are speaking into a much larger frame and one that goes even beyond Minnesota. So there are states across the country that have also been using race class gender narrative that have also been finding this notion of contrasting futures really important and very utilitarian. And so you will be hearing from other states and probably also on the national stage, a very similar tone, um, which is great because we all know, and if you don't, I'm telling you now, what makes a good message is one that is repeated. And so if we are creating the echo chamber here in Minnesota, that is that is the state that is the best state, that is the North Star state, we're creating that echo chamber here. It is also being reverberated in what people are going to be seeing on their TVs um, about national races and congressional races. And so it's, it is extremely useful. I cannot stress that enough um, for you all to lean into these like the contrast futures messaging and framework because it will sound real familiar. And familiarity is great because it tends to allow people to be like, I like this. It seems familiar. It's warm like a blanket, like a lovely hot dish. Uh, and let them seep into that as we're talking about our down ballot races, which we have a lot of work to do, but it is totally doable. And we've proven with this research the ways in which we can flip people um, to being like, oh yeah, the house is super important. I need to fight for them. We saw that time and time again in the focus groups by just simply naming, here's the things we won, here's what the other folks want, and they want to take away the stuff we won. And the defiance that sets in like, heck no, they can't have this. They can't have my pay family medical leave. Heck no. We finally are doing something great on climate and they're trying to backpack, back, backtrack on it? No. So do we get all the questions? I am not against giving people your time back. So if we don't have any more questions. A couple of really excellent uh, comments in the chat, but I think we have uh, Ooh, lift them up. The What's the comments, Erin? Uh, Dan reminded everyone not to forget about rural Minnesota, which is a very good reminder always. Um, and uh, Liz uh, reminded us of the unifying work across the state and across um, geographies uh, and socioeconomics to defeat the voter ID amendment in 2012, which I think is it's a very apt uh, comparison. Excellent. It is indeed. Okay, how are we speaking to people specifically in greater Minnesota who are feeling like the DFL doesn't speak to them? Um, whether or not that is accurate. I mean, the big thing, Sam, again, is going to be leaning into contrast futures. Like it is, it is absolutely about, um, because what we have found across the state 
is that people actually really like things like that we fed all our kids, that kids in rural Minnesota, in the suburbs, in the Twin Cities, they get to go to school and they get to have they get to have breakfast and lunch. And folks across the board really are appreciative of that. Similar, they are absolutely like voting rights, voting like pro voting rights all day long. Um, like that is a really good thing. We had a this whole group of, you know, swing voters who, I mean, largely are were pretty Republican, frankly. They just didn't like Trump. And they were like, yeah, I think voting rights are awesome. Like we, Minnesota, they're like proud that Minnesota has these very high voter turnout rates. And to be able to say like, look, this is this is like, yes, you know, candidates are on the ballot, but really our futures are. Are we going to talk about a future where we get to vote and continue to get to vote and we get continue to get to have a say about what happens? Or are we going to have a future that we're hearing about that like this might, if it gets rigged, by by some of these mega Republicans that we might not actually get be able to vote or that they continue to roll back all the protections that we have to be able to have a say. So it's like talking to people again about these futures. Yeah, I could just, I'll just add in a little bit because I've done a lot of this sort of work on education issues across greater Minnesota. My general guidance is we win in the specifics and lose in the abstractions. So when you talk to folks out there, don't talk about a DFL policy and Republican policy, uh, progressive, uh, talk about the specifics. If you're gonna talk about education, you say, we're gonna try to spend more money, put more money into schools so that we can have more good teachers and smaller class sizes. People don't object to that. We wanna have paid family leave so people can spend time with their family, family member they get sick. No one really objects to that. We wanna stand up to the health insurance company so cancer patients get the life-saving medication they need without delay. People don't see that as a Democrat versus Republican issue. So I think that just in general, keep it specific, keep it graced in reality. Try to avoid getting into big sweeping kind of abstractions and you're generally gonna be okay. Yes, Chris, that was a great point. And like to like making a finer point on that is the the notion of like saying Again, this is I sound like a broken record, but that's a good thing when we're saying, you know, people love the idea of making sure that your family member, if they have cancer, that they can get the treatment they need. Or if your loved one has, you know, needs insulin, that they're not going to be raked over the coals to be able to afford it. And we also know that right now, mega Republicans and even the Republicans in our in our current legislature actually fought against this, like. That is a, it is a real thing. And so if we lose the house, there is the potential that a lot of these protections get rolled back. Like being able to just like very concretely say, this is the thing that we we fought for and we won and we want to continue to advance. And here's some folks who actually voted against that happening. Danae, one, one other thing that I want to add for folks that Anat has been saying, Anat Shankar Sario, the uh, national messaging person, woman who like kind of was bedrock a lot of this stuff. She keeps calling it the credulity chasm. And it's it's this thing where people, if you're so like over the top in describing what our opposition will do, that people just don't believe it's real. They have a hard time wrapping their head around it. And so you there there is this thing, if you're finding that, if you're finding that people just like can't, the contrast feels so like kind of hyperbolic. Uh, the way she's talked about it is like, name a couple of the things they've said they're gonna do. Uh, Name that states that have had full GOP control have done these things. Uh, lots of the states in the South, um, they have banned books. They have uh, restricted abortion access. They have, um, you know, done some of these things that are seen as so extreme that people have a hard time wrapping their head around it. And then making sure people realize they have the power to stop it. And so I do think uh, for some of this stuff, um, you know, the the contrast has to be done in a way that is. For someone who doesn't pay attention to the news or somebody, you know, a lot of these people who maybe aren't, you know, fully engaged um, and they just don't like negative attack ads. We do have to remember that when we make these contrasts, we're, um, you know, making them bite sized enough and believable enough so that people do understand that, you know, the, the opposite of the good stuff is possible. Great. Yeah. And I think uh, it, 
the question in the conversation is also a good reminder just that the, to go back to the top of the deck, the core framing, two futures, not two candidates, protecting the gains we've made for our families. Don't need to, like, we, I think as much as we can rise above partisanship and process, uh, the closer we are to where, how, how people are already thinking about this. Um, one other question, uh, Lucy wanted to know how we will counter the unlimited and ridiculous amount of money being spent in targeted races. I don't know if we have any narrative guidance to help out that issue. Yeah. <laughs> That's a, that is most certainly a, a continued reality for a lot of spaces and places. Um, but uh, as we have noted, the way in which you can leverage um, a corporate profit future against the future that is about people and people having care, people being able to care for themselves and others is super important. And then you can most certainly connect what are these like, you know, the the big corporations that are funneling their money into, you know, a handful of Republican and MAGA Republican um, candidates. What are, like, follow the money. Here's the kind of future that they want. They want to be able, you know, if it's like big giant healthcare corps, like it's like they want to be able to make a profit off of your illness. That is what they're doing. And they are putting their money where their values are. And we also know that we have a set of uh, DFL, DFLers who are committed to doing all that we can to ensure that that is not the future we have. It's one in which people can afford quality care, quality health care. It's why we fought and won to have debt relief when it comes to our medical bills. Like being able to like talk about that in a really concrete way will also get people to understand like you could do it where you're talking about both like the money that's being funneled into campaigns, but in a way that's still activating people to take action, not just because they're angry that like, there's too much money in politics, because frankly, that can cut both ways. But instead saying, who is giving money and for what reason? What kind of future do they want for you? And how are they leveraging their money to make it happen? I'll just say, one of the core ideas from this race block gender narrative thing all along has been how do you counteract how, how do you run campaigns that are going to get outspent? And one of the things we do is that we kind of use this base out philosophy where we get that choir to sing like Josh's Muppets, right? It's you create messages that people not only agree with, but they are uh, agitated and excited to repeat and tell their friends. And that's kind of our base. And they reach out and they get the persuadables and those persuadables kind of get persuaded more by the people they know than they do about an ad they see. So, is it like going to overcome a 20 to 1 spending deficit? Probably realistically, no. Is it going to come make you a lot closer if you're somewhere in the ballpark? Yeah. And we've got lots of evidence of underfunded campaigns beating big money by doing it that way. So kind of built into what we create here is this idea that we're going to get our base and we're going to get them activated. We're going to find, move them and that they're going to help reach those persuadables, not just through advertising. Not, not to say the ads don't help and that there's not part of it. But really, that sort of organic person-to-person, one-to-one communication is a huge part of what made the race class narrative structure work over the last few years. I mean, I, I feel like it might just be piling out at this point, but it is important to note that their policies are unpopular. Our opposition's policies are unpopular, uh, giving tax breaks to rich people, uh, backing off regulations, banning books, the stuff that like they're winning primary races on is not stuff that the vast majority of Americans, Minnesotans want. And so it it both is like the getting our choir equipped to talk about this, which Janae and Chris talked about, but it's also a reminder that we need to be adept at not letting them dog whistle their way and use these kind of divide and conquer tactics that are so successful because they know that if they laid out their policy proposals, they would lose, which is why they say, you know, uh, you know, waste and fraud, and and this is going to other people and those people and and fears around public safety. Um, it's why they do those tactics, and it's why this work is so important because uh, low information voters, people who aren't paying attention, can be confused. They they see a scary political ad about you know like these people let our cities burn and are pro criminals, 
And it's important that we have these conversations about why they're doing these tactics, which is the race, class, gender narrative, and then, you know, bring the conversation back to the two choices, the, um, you know, freedom versus control and future versus past. It's just, it, it really is uh, what the superpower of this work is that we, we have tools that can be used against their only weapon, which is divide and conquer. And unfortunately it's been very successful. Um, but here in Minnesota, we've, we have shown that no matter how much money and no matter how much mud they sling, we can and do win. And, um, you know, it's something that this people on this call have to be the front lines of doing that work. All right, folks. Well, we all have our marching orders. You have the website that is going to have, that already does have all of the tools and we'll soon have this uh, recording as well. And we're going to see you in the field. Y'all have a blessed day. Thanks for joining us. Bye, everybody.